So uh, net neutrality is a very contentious topic these days, and uh, part of the reason is because there are different aspects of net neutrality. One of the aspects is whether internet service providers should be able to block or throttle certain kind of traffic or application. The second aspect is whether they should must treat all right type of traffic equally. And the third is whether they should be able to uh, have different classes of service or different tiers on the internet and maybe charge differently under paid prioritization. So we should probably look at these uh, topics separately. So, so the first aspect is whether uh, internet service providers should be able to block or throttle certain kinds of applications. And uh, the reason is that some of the applications and some of the types of traffic do uh, consume more bandwidth than others. And at peak times, uh, we have these tra traffic contributing more to congestion than others, but everybody else on the internet suffers as a result. So Comcast's attempt to throttle BitTorrent was indeed uh, an attempt at uh, trying to uh, ensure that no particular type of traffic uh, gets uh, disproportionate amount of access to the network resources. Now, uh, however, if the internet service provider were to start uh, charging differently for the same type of traffic to different websites, say charging different for Google versus Yahoo, then there is a reasonable uh, issue uh, about net neutrality and there may be need for regulation, but that hasn't happened. And what we are uh, seeing is that uh, the regulations that are uh, being imposed are really trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, so I would just like to add that, you know, uh, the uh, three things that Soumya outlined. The third and first are sort of integrally linked, that whether you are able to throttle certain services. And this idea seems a uh, uh, bad idea uh, at the outset, but if you think about who gets more benefit out of the internet, should the people who are using torrent uh, be able to use uh, internet disproportionately more than people by using it for other, perhaps more productive purposes, is a contentious issue. Uh, the freedom to access internet doesn't mean that you you should be able to misutilize it, and that's part of the problem with the current net neutrality uh, argument. That it doesn't add any uh, value-based pricing or value-based approach to pricing the traffic. And uh, uh, again, uh, when when we think about discrimination of you know, Yahoo versus uh, Google, that might be problematic. But certainly we can legislate that aspect as to what should the pricing or discriminatory pricing be based on rather than uh, having a blanket statement that there should be no discrimination. Yeah. And, and in this context, one of the analogies that you hear is uh, uh, that to the postal system saying that the mailman shouldn't get to decide uh, which package uh, reaches you. And that's true, yes, it shouldn't. But at the same time, the postal system does get to decide how much you pay depending on how heavy your package is and how fast you want to get it delivered. So that brings to the second and the third uh, issue that I mentioned earlier, which is that uh, certain applications are uh, heavier on the internet in the sense that they consume more bandwidth, they uh, generate higher volume of uh, data, and they are more time sensitive. And so as a result, uh, you have to uh, potentially pay differently for those kind of uh, traffic because they are imposing a different amount of net uh, externality on the other users. And uh, we often see in the, in the context of the uh, uh, in the context of the postal system, people can intuitively understand that they have to pay more for a heavy package than the light package because it's tangible. Whereas when it comes to the internet, when we did focus group studies, people really don't have much of an idea of how much uh, bandwidth their tr applications are consuming, yeah. which one is consuming more of their data quota. I think that's really the key point that people don't have an idea about how much different it is to download a website versus a streaming movie from Netflix. The requirements, the, uh, the, the quality of service that the network has to deliver to be able to get a movie streaming versus getting a website where you don't even realize the delay that is occurring uh, are uh, poles apart. And so having or uh, saying that the these things should be uh, priced the same way really is akin to sort of not understanding what your what your package weight is yeah. uh, when you go to uh, when you go to mail it.
Yeah. I think that's a great analogy. Yeah. And the other aspect is about paid prioritization. Now that you have different applications that have different uh, requirements in terms of how fast they need to be delivered in order for the user to have a better experience, uh, it is natural to think of it in terms of separate lanes, right? And uh, what we, uh, when we think about it, right now there are uh, users that just use web browsing or emails, which are like mice traffic on the internet compared to those that are binge watching Netflix at uh, peak times, which is really the elephant traffic. And so right now these uh, light users are subsidizing uh, the cost of access for the heavy users. And uh, uh, they shouldn't be doing that, and nor should they be forced to be stuck in the same lane with this uh, heavy traffic. So instead of thinking of uh, or framing this issue as a uh, fast lane versus slow lane for the rich versus the poor, the real, uh, the a better way to think of it as a separate lane for semi trucks and a separate lane for regular cars, with the semi trucks having to pay a higher toll. I think uh, Samia made a great point, which might have uh, uh, perhaps. Uh, uh, is again one of the things that is not very well understood. A vast majority of the users on the internet actually subsidize the heavy users, you know, b by paying the same amount. Uh, uh, and it's because their usage uh, dominates the usage of, uh, of normal users. So in fact, uh, it's not inconceivable that if you do uh, value-based pricing, you might end up a vast majority of pay, people paying substantially less than what they are paying even now. So, uh, so I think that was a great point that you made. But let's let's sort of uh, not get lost. Though we are not advocating that uh, internet should be uh, uh, redesigned to constrain uh, from people uh, using it. Uh, in fact, I think the current level of usage uh, has come far too late. We were talking about the same kinds of services almost 20 years back. Back in 93, 94, you can pick up Time, Times Magazine, Business Week, and they all had story about steaming videos. Right? It has taken 23 years to get us there. Uh, that's three lifetimes in internet, internet time. Uh, that's a huge amount of time that, that, uh, has, uh, that it has taken for us to get there. And, Part of the reason I believe in my research, uh, which I started doing in 93, way ahead of its time perhaps, uh, has shown that uh, it is due to the lack of investment incentives. We are seeing this. Uh, 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 some of the infrastructure companies are getting out of this business, or out of providing yeah. infrastructure. With uh, Verizon uh, just announcing that they are going to stop their uh, services, the wireline part of the business, they are going to sell it off, the voice, DSL, and Fios uh, in California, uh, Florida, and Texas. And part of the reason was they directly cited net neutrality and the Title II as the reason for them getting out of the business. AT&T is expanding in Mexico. And uh, so we are seeing that the wireline, in the big companies are reluctant to invest any more in the wireline uh, uh, industry uh, and, the, uh, and the infrastructure, especially now the regulations are becoming more and more uh, difficult for them to bear. So, so I think uh, at least my thinking is that what we should really focus on is uh, making sure that the free part of the internet grows and keeps on growing at a reasonable clip, but also provide uh, in investment opportunities and incentives for co infrastructure companies to invest in the internet. So if, uh, if we uh, have the current level of service uh, and the growth in the service rate available to everyone and provide uh, a separate sort of framework or a framework that uh, allows for payment for higher level of services, I think we can reach both objectives but focusing on current net neutrality sort of uh, law is, uh, is really going to constrain the growth. We are going to have fewer players, uh, and the growth in the infrastructure will decrease, uh, and because of that, innovation in services is going to automatically decrease. 
And, and you raised a very important point about historical precedents for uh, research on dynamic pricing and looking at how the network should be uh, operated and regulated and so on. And uh, like we have to ask the question whether the internet is really neutral when we talk about fast lanes. Like in effect, these companies, the big companies like Google, Netflix, Facebook, they already have a, effectively a fast lane through their peering relationships directly with Comcast and Verizon and AT&T and by having their content located deep into the internet uh, service providers network uh, through uh, content delivery networks. So uh, really they already have a mechanism for fast lanes for their users to enjoy a better service. And uh, the real question is who pays for these services, right? We Previously we saw that the businesses were supposed to be subsidizing consumers and you can think of 1-800 numbers for telephone networks. But right now the businesses uh, are being subsidized or their delivery models are being subsidized by consumers. Businesses are centralizing their operations in large data centers, in areas where it is cheaper to operate, uh, labor costs are lower, energy costs are lower, and consumers are paying for the cost of delivery of that data. And the reason why Facebook, Google are, are kind of advocating uh, the strict net neutrality rules is perhaps because they sh should instead start thinking about subsidizing the users uh, uh, through sponsored content, through sponsored data, and other such plans. And in terms of pricings that you mentioned, like we have uh, right now a a reign of penalty based mechanisms, throttling, capping, and so on. So the whole idea is that because the supply is low uh, in terms of the spectrum is lower than the demand, we need to uh, penalize demand. Instead of thinking of it in that perspective, my research looks at how you can uh, create an incentive-based solution, like users who are using um, data at uh, uncongested periods, that is off-peak times, should receive some kind of reward for their good behavior. And so if we were to design these kind of uh, pricing mechanisms, such as dynamic pricing, that uh, allows for equitable and efficient allocation of resources and rewards those users that ha have uh, good behavior in terms of creating less congestion for the network, then we would have a better uh, allocation of the resources, a more efficient allocation. And uh, with so title the, two and so on, it might be much more difficult. So one of the things, Somia, that uh, we often hear about uh, is that uh, not having the free internet is going to uh, throttle the innovation aspect uh, of the internet. Lots of new businesses uh, became a mainstay Netflix, for example, or Amazon, because of their free access to the internet. And this is the argument that Google makes, Facebook makes, that uh, they would not have been able to uh, survive if uh, there was a faster part of the internet. What do you think about that? So, as I said, they already are having peering relationships. They already have content delivery networks which have their uh, co uh, computer servers, web servers uh, deep inside the uh, infrastructure of the network providers. So, already they have a virtual uh, a service that, uh, or a virtual fast lane, and they're paying for that service. Now, if I were, uh, and I have created a, a startup, and so if I were a new startup, the next Facebook or next Google, who should I be more worried about in terms of uh, uh, as a potential threat? It, is it uh, Google and Facebook, or is it Comcast or Verizon, at and Who would be uh, probably uh, uh, saving my back, right? Um, I think this uh, question of fast lane is kind of misplaced. Uh, they, these big companies already are uh, generating huge amount of traffic. And if you look back, 10 years back, the traffic was evenly distributed across all websites. By 2009, 50% of the traffic came from 150, only 150 yeah. web uh, content providers. Currently, 50% of the traffic comes from top 30 uh, content providers, which includes Netflix, Google, and Facebook. So they are really trying to um, uh, uh, talk about, when they talk about net neutrality, they are trying to ensure that uh, these mechanisms that can uh, give users uh, uh, a compensation or some kind of uh, uh, incentive uh, for but it also, good behavior. But it also assumes that the network, the free part of the network will shrink or stay the same and not grow with the rest of the services and networks, with the paid part of the network. But that can be legislated, yeah. right? I mean, we can ensure that the current network, the free part of the network, keeps on growing. Um, uh, for example, we can take a very simple, and I haven't thought through all the mathematical aspects of this, but a simple sort of thought process is, uh, let's say we uh, specify what kind of free level of services uh, needs to be provided. Let's say current 
current level of service. And then uh, as the networks grow their paid part of the, uh, as the infrastructure providers grow the paid part of the network, they have to grow the free part of the network in the same proportion. Yeah. That'll ensure that there is enough capacity available for uh, new businesses to innovate yeah. and compete with Facebook or Google yeah. or whatever, and they don't necessarily have to pay for the proof of concept or the initial growth part of, of their network once they reach a level of services where they need higher level yeah. of network access, perhaps, um, perhaps they could they could start paying yeah. right so it's it doesn't preclude innovation it's just a fallacy to think that okay you know once there is a paid part of the network it'll all all the yeah. new capacity will go to the paid part yeah. of the network that's what we should be legislating yeah. if we want to legislate anything. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's a huge assumption that the lower tier would be starving uh, and proportional investment, as you suggested, is going to uh, solve those kind of problems. And really, Title II is probably too restrictive uh, in terms of uh, what uh, the network's operator should be subjected to. Uh, the, in, the, in the U.S., it has grown, uh, like it has seen faster deployment of services, both in wired and wireline, uh, wireless sectors, and uh, uh, the Title II really uh, burdens the operators with a lot more than what is needed in order to ensure an open uh, Internet. So um, uh, do you want to uh, sort of talk about what you are afraid of with, with this? What does the future look like? So currently I'm afraid of two things, right? One is that uh, my speeds can go down because as, I, as we said that uh, many of the wi big wireline networks are uh, getting out of the wireline business, selling off their wireline business and if they don't invest because of the stricter regulation, then the infrastructure is going to suffer. Uh, the second part is my prices will go up because now uh, when the uh, operators are being regulated as utilities, they would be have to pay a levy of uh, state level and local level fees uh, as, as telecommunication carriers. And so the bills are going to go up. So my speed goes down and my bill goes up. And that is obviously so, something that is an unintended consequence of, of having, uh, like, we are, and, and really net neutrality is kind of a, a misnomer in the sense, right? It, it is supposed to improve the, uh, improve the quality of the network and the experience for the user, but the potential downsides are, uh, also need to be taken into account, and it doesn't seem that they, that has been done very carefully. So if I look at the evil side of my thinking, you know, uh, I see opportunities to develop a CDN type of uh, access for consumers, uh, where I can put consumers closer to the content, right, and charge them higher rates. I mean, this is, if you open up the network access that we are opening up now, uh, nothing prevents me uh, for cre from creating these uh, higher level of access for which I have to pay more. So, you know, again, similar kind of uh, effect mm -hmm. that um, my the net effect is going to be I have to pay more, and again uh, the access for people uh, who aren't on this part of the network is going to be uh, uh, going to be slower. It's sort of a roundabout way of achieving the same thing. Uh, the other thing that really worries me is that that we may go back to the origins of the network uh, of the internet or. Uh, uh, or, or uh, computer networks, which is that we might have pro proliferation of private networks, uh, where we might have uh, a higher level or advanced level of services available only on these private networks. Uh, these will, you know, again, uh, the infrastructure is shared, but uh, infrastructure providers will have incentives to lease uh, their network capacities to people uh, who are providing these private networks to provide these higher level of services rather than putting that uh, uh, capacity on the general part of the network. So again, um, uh, that will be uh, more restrictive. It will uh, it'll affect consumers uh, significantly and we really then might have haves and have not type of effect which we don't really see, okay. uh, which I don't see actually in, in a tiered network uh, architecture.